uh, similarities and differences between Spanish and English. And I hope as a result that those of you who are Spanish, who are learning English, will get a few pointers in the right direction. But also those of you who are Spanish and who are perhaps thinking of teaching your own language to English learners might also get some idea of what English uh, people find difficult when they learn Spanish. So it's not just all the problems that Spanish speakers have learning English, it's also to show you that English people also have terrible problems sometimes learning Spanish. <laughs> I get it very well. <laughs> right, so we're going to have a look at um, uh, the vowels uh, divided into these categories. And I'll give you a general contents list, uh, which uh, covers everything down to the distribution of consonants in Spanish. As you can see, uh, I have a great uh, difficult task to get all this into about 50 minutes. So it will be a rather fast romp through. Right, let's have a look first of all at the, uh, the vowel, uh, vowel system. And what you can see immediately, uh, I do suggest you look on the uh, on the wall here rather than in the uh, on the paper because everything that's on here you've got on paper. But I've done it so that you can make a few notes by the side of the slide if you want to. So that's why you've got these uh, little lines. There. What we see immediately is the Spanish vowel system is simpler and more symmetrical than the English one. There are five monophthongs all of them found in stressed syllables, so e, a, a, o, u, and they are found also in unstressed syllables with no change of quality, so ilifa, banana, belele, and so on. And there's also a more open allophone, for those of you who know what an allophone is, in closed syllables such as perla. Right? Uh, now, English learners find it very difficult to keep a monophthongal quality in final vowels. And they also find that it's very difficult not to reduce weak vowels to schwa. Now in my classes I'm trying desperately to get everybody to reduce everything to schwa more or less, <laughs> it's unstressed. But uh, for English learners of Spanish, it's entirely the other way around. You know, we, we want to do that and we don't want us to. So there we are, that's the first uh, big difference. And of course, Spanish learners of English find it very difficult to weaken appropriately. Now, um, just to give you an idea of what it sounds like when English people reduce Spanish words when they shouldn't, they'll say things like Felipe. No? And what else will they say? Uh, Bar Barcelona, Valencia. You know, without being able to say Barcelona, Valencia, and not weak and those um, unstressed vowels. So, uh, a simpler system than the English one that you are already familiar with. However, on the other hand, there are rather more Spanish diphthongs. Uh, well, you can see that they're all there. We've got le, baile, oi, cuida, delda. That's a particularly difficult one for English speakers. The el diphthong that you get in Europa, you'll find very few English people who've lived there for years and years can say Europa properly. They'll say Europa and things like that, you see. So, pausa, fulad, and a marginal one here, I think, for the bowl, this old sound that you get in the place name. Uh, I think it's quite common in Galicia to have that um, diphthong, but perhaps not um, in mainland Spain. I should say I'm only um, concentrating on the Spanish spoken in the peninsula. I, I really can't cover every possibility, so forgive me if you come from Argentina or Mexico or somewhere else. Uh, English diphthongs, well, you have a, a row of these English diphthongs, and you can see that there are of them. <coughs> English monothongs, here they are, there should be 12 of them if I've counted correctly. Um, the ones that you can see on line one, on the top line, occur in 
all positions. So <coughs> at the beginning, the middle, and at the end of, uh, of words. Those on the second line do not occur in final position. So you don't get uh, that row of, of, uh, of uh, vowel sounds at the end, except possibly the last one in the row, the I sound. Now, you do still find a few people who will say, I work in the city, and they'll say city, it's pretty, and happy, but not very many of them. It sounds very old-fashioned. If you look in older dictionaries, you'll find that those words I've just mentioned will be, um, the vowel sound in the final position will be an I vowel. Nowadays, we say happy, pretty, city, with a, more of an E quality, though not with the length of the normal E, the two dots after it. And on the third line, there's a one vowel all on its own, which is schwa. It occurs in all positions, but of course only in unstressed syllables. It can never be stressed. And uh, it's uh, the uh, bugbear of anybody learning English because it's the most common vowel sound and it's one that nobody ever wants to do. Uh, these are some Spanish words and place names which many native speakers of English are familiar with. And as I said before, English speakers, we can unstress the words to show us. So they'll say Madrid, that's how we say the word Madrid in English. Barcelona. Valencia, we don't say ba, we say the, Valencia. So we're weakening those uh, vowel sounds. In both languages, we find an alternation of stress in word, words such as photo, photographer, photographico, and photo, <coughs> photographer, photographic. There's the same or it's the same word in Spanish and in English. Spanish, you notice, maintains the vowel quality in unstressed syllables, while English reduces the vowel literally to schwa. Weak forms, I guess most of you have come across a few weak forms by now. Uh, they are everywhere in English, these little weak forms. Um, prepositions, conjunctions, certain, certain pronouns and very common verbs like the verb can, which becomes can, and was that became the that becomes was, and, and uh, were that becomes were, and so on. Um, and these, of course, don't occur at all in Spanish. It's very difficult for teachers, I think, teachers of English, um, because uh, we often have, we, we always have really, the strong form in a question, so where do you come from? There's the little word from at the end of the sentence, which must be pronounced with full vowel, not the schwa, so it's a strong form, if you like. Um, but the answer, of course, is from Spain. And so the sentence, the question that your students listen to, requires them to somehow give you an answer which is a different pronunciation. Where are you from? 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 And this is very hard to get across to, to uh, people learning the language. Occasionally, of course, the strong form and the weak form can indicate a different meaning. I don't know whether you've come across it. So if we say, for example, the word sum, S-O-M-E, the word sum has two pronunciations. It can be pronounced as sum, as a strong form, sum, or sum, with a which one. So if we had this sentence, uh, Dad's brought home some lecturer for dinner, that's fine. But if we reduce that sum to sum, and so Dad's brought home some lecturer for dinner. It sounds like you're going to eat the lecturer. It sounds like cannibalism. You know, that's on the menu for tonight, the lecturer. So you have to be a little bit careful. 
Now, if you want to sound like native uh, speakers of English, you do need to pay attention to the forms. However, there are plenty of very successful speakers of English as a second language in the world who don't uh, use weak forms at all. Nelson Mandela comes to mind <laughs> immediately. Um, successful man, but uh, he doesn't uh, sound like a native speaker or anything like. In Spanish, it's sometimes possible for a vowel to become long syllabic. So we have paniagua and paniagua. Now this doesn't happen in English. You can't say happy ending. Happy ending. It's happy ending. Happy ending. Happy ending. Not happy ending. So that's just a very minor little thing. You can't say happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. It's happy happy anniversary. Let's move on now to some consonants. Both languages have the same set of voiceless and voiced stops. There they are. However, they do have some realizational differences. So although the same set of, of, of uh, uh, consonants are there, they don't always come out quite the same. Let's have a look at some of the realizational differences. In English, T and D, T and D, are alveolar. If you're not sure what alveolar means, that there is a place in your mouth just behind your top teeth, uh, which is the, called the alveolar ridge. If you have a clean thumb and you put it in your mouth and just feel behind your top teeth, you will feel a rough, bumpy ridge, and that is called the alveolar ridge, all right? And that is where the tip of the tongue touches for T and D in English. In Spanish, the tongue is further forward, a bit further forward. It's a dental sound in Spanish, so the tongue tip touches the back of the top teeth. Um, another noticeable difference is that English voiceless stops are aspirated before a strong vowel in the same syllable, though not after S. And there is no aspiration in Spanish. Do you know what I mean when I say aspiration? Most of you. <laughs> Some of you don't. <laughs> Some of you need reminding. Okay. Well, let's suppose <coughs> I've got a little bit of paper here. If I say the word paper with this little strip of paper in front of me, just watch what happens. Paper. Paper. Well, that was a big one. All right, you say Hooman, don't you? Yes. Now, I want to ask if there's a Spanish person here near me. Yes, somebody Spanish near me. Wait a minute. I'm not, it's all right. I'm not. Well, I don't bother myself. I'd like you to do something different. You know the uh, the nickname for somebody who's called Jose? Yeah, a nickname for someone who's called Jose. All right. Can you do the same thing and say and say that for me? Baby. Tell them so they can see. Exactly what I wanted you to do. No movement at all, no movement of the paper. Now, what it means is that in English, there's a lot of air coming out, isn't there? If I say paper, which is as near as I can get to Pepe, if I say paper, you see the paper moving quite a lot. Um, if I say the word pie, well, let's see what happens if I say the word pie. Pie. Yes, you saw it move, didn't you? Pie. If I say it with an S in front now and I say spy, 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 no movement at all, really. Okay? So that's what I mean by aspiration. Uh, English voiceless stops are aspirated, that means a lot of air comes out before a strong vowel in the same syllable, but it doesn't happen after S. But there's no aspiration in Spanish. Now, aspiration actually helps us to distinguish 
between the English phrases, my turn, and my turn. So those of you who are familiar with the, the symbols by now, you can see that in my turn, there is a little H represented after the letter T, after the sound T, which is a, a representation of aspiration. So my turn and my turn don't sound quite the same to native English speakers. They might sound the same to you, but they don't quite sound the same to me. Uh, I'm sorry, but um, I learned in my department that future calculation my turn and my turn would be pronounced the same, so that the two sound might um, um, moves to the um, and Well, it might do in some people, but it certainly doesn't in me, <laughs> and it doesn't in most people I know. Um, I think we can make a distinction on this particular one, uh, just as we can with pea stalks and peace talks. You see that there is more aspiration uh, in the second line than you find in the first line there. Now, what I will say, though, is that with the sort of changes that are happening in English, in British English at the moment, um, you don't really need to have this distinction between my turn and my turn, because most people nowadays are saying, my turn, my turn. I might earn a lot of money if I go to Brazil. I might earn. And so the question doesn't arise because the T is being, the T sound is being replaced by a dot stop, and this is spreading very fast in uh, English. So young people will pronounce things probably that way. The final T very often becoming a dot stop. Another realizational difference is that the voice stops in Spanish are fully voiced in all positions. Whereas in English, they're fully voiced only when surrounded by other voiced sounds. So the D in the word dog and the D at the end of the word bead are partially de-voiced. There isn't a great deal of voice in those two sounds. But if we have the D in the middle of the word beaded, then that D in the middle of the vowels there, in the middle of the word, uh, is fully voiced. So it's a, it's a very slight difference, but it's, uh, it's noticeable. In Spanish, voice stops in intervocalic position, that means between vowels, and often in initial position, are usually realized as fricatives or even as approximants. So uh, we've got Barcelona, Barcelona, Dime, Gafas on the left hand side. But if I put those initial consonants between vowels, you're much likely to hear a Barcelona, not a bar, you know, with a, with a complete stop there. A Barcelona, y dime, dime, instead of dime, dime. Nogal, nogal. That's a voice fricative, a voice being fricative. Now, this doesn't happen at all in English, so please don't um, transfer this Spanish habit to English because a baby boy is a baby boy and it's b, b, b all the way through, as is also a beer bottle. So, those of you who are not into babies but prefer beer, a beer bottle, right? And everybody, not everybody, everybody. So a, bit, a really hard B sound, a really hard D sound in those words is needed. In uh, most accents of Spanish, no distinction is made between the pronunciation of B and D. Now I know this because I have a little Spanish nephew who is always you know, having problems with how he spells words. I mean, I, I can never understand it, because English people, yes, we have terrible problems with spelling. But I always think that a, a Spanish child should find it easier, but he doesn't. He's always saying, es ve alto o ve baja, or es ve de baja o ve de burro. You know, which one is it? Because he can't hear the difference, because there is no difference. That's why he can't hear a difference. 
so he doesn't know which letter to write when he's writing something. Now in English, B, B if you like, B is a voiced bilabial stop, and B is a voiced labiodental fricative. There are different types of sound. One is a stop, the air is completely stopped from coming out because the lips are together. Uh, and the other is a fricative sound, the lips are not entirely closed. And it's called a labiodental fricative simply because the top teeth are resting on the bottom lip, get it the right way round, top teeth on bottom lip, uh, but not enough to completely form a closure so air can still escape. Now this is really quite important. So the very common word, very, must be very, not very, and not very, not something in between the two. So it mustn't be very, and it mustn't be very, it must be very, with a verb sound at the beginning. Now, this becomes incredibly important when you get to the last three examples I've put up here, because these are all medical uh, contrasts, if you like. Now, I've done some work uh, a few years ago, did some work with some uh, Spanish doctors who wanted to come to this country to work as GPs, general practitioners. And one of them had um, tremendous problems with the difference between TV and TB. And we had this bizarre situation where the doctor was saying to the patient, um, does anybody in your family have TB? <laughs> and the man said, well, yeah, he said, I know it's not good for them, but all my kids have got their own TVs all over the place. And so there was this mismatch, really, this, this lack of comprehension between TB and TB. TB is tuberculosis. It's a, an abbreviation for tuberculosis. Similarly, very, very, and very, very, are two different things. Very, very is a kind of illness. You know, it's a, it's a very, very serious illness. And vowels and bowels, well, you can imagine, but I do have a story to tell you. It's an apocryphal story of um, a very famous Spanish opera singer who came to, I think, she, I think she went to Wales uh, to give a lecture. And she was lecturing about singing, you know, how to sing. And she said, when you sing, you must open your bowels. <laughs> well, you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, she lost the audience on that one. Yes, you see. So it's very important to get that contrast right. <laughs> now, in English, the voiced alveolar stop, the d sound, and the voiced interdental fricative, the d sound, are separate phonemes and they occur initially, medially, and finally. So I've given you a sentence here which has them initially, medially, and finally. I loathe this hot weather. I think I brought that one up when we had a heat wave in August once, but anyway, you can imagine that it's hot weather. I loathe this hot weather. So loathe ends in the, this begins with the, and weather has the sound the in the middle. Now, in Spanish, the bird sound exists. You do have it in Spanish. Um, but it's an allophone of, of d, of that other phony. So you get it in words like ava, ava, valladolid, valladolid, there's a d sound there. But you don't associate it with th. Now, the th sound in English is always written as th. And the real problem occurs for Spanish speakers learning English with the initial th sound. Now, if I asked you to write down all the words you can think of in English that begin with the sound th, you would find that there are about a dozen, about 11 or 12 words. Uh, and they're all extremely common words. They're words like this, that, these, those, they, them, then, thus, though, are there any others? There, 
know the two spellings. Um, and there might be one that I haven't remembered. Uh, the problem is that it's all too tempting to say dis, dat, these, does. And of course, does and those are two different words in English. So you have to watch the the sound on words that begin with that sound in English, especially those very, very common words that I've just mentioned. Uh, let's move on now to fricatives. What is immediately apparent when you look at this slide is that English has rather more fricatives than Spanish has. You can see rather a lot more of them along that top line. So Spanish um, has a th sound, Castilian Spanish has the incidental voices fricative, th, um, but it doesn't have the voiced one as a phoneme, only as an allophone, allophone of, of D, as I've just said. It has the voiceless s sound, but it doesn't have a voiced z sound. It doesn't have either of the next two, sh or z, not in Castilian Spanish anyway. I guess in Argentina you do have some of, you have some of those sounds, yes. And uh, it doesn't have h, the final one in English, as in hot or harrow on the hill. Um, but it does have. Uh, one that English doesn't possess, which is this velar fricative, ch, quarter sound. Um, so there we are. The Spanish, the, the sound z, the voiced z, the voiced partner of s, if you like, is sometimes heard in Spanish before a nasal. So mismo, I've heard when people say mismo, turismo, and nobody finds it strange. Um, so it does exist just about. The problem, I think, in English is the spelling again, because all the English sibilants may be spelt with an S, a letter S. So same, rose, sugar, vision, there are four different pronunciations of the same letter. Um, now, you notice in Spanish there is no sh sound in Castilian Spanish. This means that there is no contrast between s and sh. And because there's no contrast, it doesn't actually matter in Spanish if the s sound takes on some of the properties of sh and becomes a bit more shushy, a bit more sh like, right? And I often hear people, and there are people among you now, who use a, a, an S which has moved over a little bit in Spanish towards SH. That's fine in Spanish. That's perfect. Of course it is. There's no contrast. But when you come to English, you have to make an absolutely clear distinction between S and SH. C and SHE must be absolutely separate, mustn't they? Otherwise, you're saying. So sometimes you need to watch that. The um, Spanish lima fricative, the, the hota sound, is sometimes incorrectly substituted in English where we would want uh, an H, a H sound. If you find it difficult to make uh, an English H, an English H sound, this is what you have to do. You have to run up the stairs and preferably several flights of stairs. And when you get to the top, you will be out of breath. And when you're out of breath, I'm quite sure, even in Spanish, you don't go, no, you go, just the same time. That's how you get an H sound. So if your students ever tell you they can't do it, that's what you tell them to do. Run up the stairs a few times, and you'll do a perfect H sound in English. Uh, can you keep your questions until the end? Hi, it was just like something about it to see in Spanish, about the H sound. Yes. With that, I, I can leave it. Uh, leave, leave it to the end yeah. if you don't mind, because I'm not, I, I really can't deal with them. Yes, yes. A different yes. variety. Okay, leave it to the end. Um, Spanish, of course, has a letter H, but you don't pronounce it, do you? You, you just ignore it. Okay. So you say Alhambra, not Alhambra. Lots of English people say Alhambra wrongly, don't they? Um, 
Now, common verbs in English, like does, has, was, is, and the tag questions, isn't it, wasn't it, they all contain the sound z, not sir, not sir. So, are there any Catalan speakers here? Any Catalan speakers? Yes, okay. Well, <laughs> wasn't it, wasn't it, must not sound like the Catalan wasn't it. Wasn't it is Catalan. Wasn't it is English, right? Okay. Moving on. We'll move on to some Africans. Now, this is where it gets complicated for me because when you compare two languages, um, you find very often that there are areas where things overlap and it's really very difficult to sort out the overlap. It's difficult to organise it coherently. Uh, Africans, two African phonemes in English, church and church, the sound that you get in church and the sound that you get in judge. Spanish has ch as a phoneme, but j also occurs as an allophone of phallic sounds. So I've heard people say me llamo Yolanda, but I've also heard people say me llamo Yolanda, Yolanda, like that, okay? And it doesn't seem to matter in Spanish at all. It's perfectly okay. The trouble is you can't do that in English, you know? Um, so what you find in Spanish is that orthographic double L and Y, orthographic Y, are often realised as j. And there's an example, janta ja, geno jeso, yo, 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 and so on. In English, there is a phonemic distinction between y and j. So, you, ju, yet, jet, your, jaw, must be absolutely separate. You can't say, if you say ju, then you're saying um, uh, a different word. You're not saying you. It's a different word altogether. So that's one to uh, work on. In Spanish, it's possible to say con hierro with a G sound. Con hierro. Con hierro. Are you happy with that if I say it that way? Con hierro. Now, if you compare that with English, in a similar sequence, you have when you, can you, and it is absolutely impossible in English to say when you and can you. I hear a lot of it, so be careful with that. You can't say in English when you, when you go, or can you go. It's got to be when you, can you, with a y sound, not a j sound. However, the difficulty arises because we can say, did you, would you, that's all right. We don't have to say, can you, uh, uh, did you, and would you. We can happily say, did you, with a j sound, and would you, with a j sound. Right? So that's all right. Because these are environments in which assimilation usually takes place in English. Assimilation means where uh, sounds become more similar in some respects to uh, sounds around them. So similarly, would you like a drink? Would you like a drink? I can say it that way if I like. Or I can say, would you, would you like a drink? You hear both. Both are correct. What you need is a drink. What you, what you, what you. You hear both. Both are all right. But you have to be very careful when you have a nasal involved not to say when you, can you. That's, I'm afraid, not acceptable. Now, this leads to errors in English learners' pronunciation of Spanish. So I've heard people, instead of saying cultura, they'll say cultura, agricultura, agricultura. You hear a ch sound creeping in because uh, they're. they're applying English assimilation practices to it.
Both Spanish and English have three nasal phonemes. The first two, as you can see, are the same, but the third one there is different in each case. So Spanish has a palatal nasal, whereas English has a velar nasal. And this allows uh, the difference in Spanish between pena and pena, and in English the difference between ran and ran. Both English and Spanish have a velar nasal before the velar stops. Those of you who uh, do transcription will perhaps have been surprised at first when you found that you had to put uh, an N, you know, the one with the long tail in, before a K or G sound. So in Spanish you have angustia, banco, velar nasal there, just as you have in the English word anger. And it occurs in Spanish before, before the velar fricative, as you might expect. So San Jerónimo, Don Juan, Don José, you know, you're, you're hearing a velar nasal.
This is a perfect environment in which to insert an R before a following vowel sound. So instead of having sesenta ocho, you end up with sesenta riocho, sesenta ri. I have to do it with a complete English accent because it's impossible to do it otherwise. Sesenta riocho. <laughs> and some of you will know there's this, this, this song. I never did learn the first line of it, but it goes like this. Da 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 da. Do you know the one I mean? Yeah. What's the next line? Yes, uh, it's Kimime Spanga, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, I can almost guarantee that if you nip down to Torre Molinos, I'll bet there are lots of English people, they'll play this song and they'll all be dancing and singing. You know. <laughs> and when it gets to the Kimime Spanga bit, they'll say, Que viva España, and they'll put in an R. <laughs> so nip down to Torre Molinos and see if I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Semi-vowels, these function as uh, consonants that sound like vowels. We've got English y sound or word. I've uh, put up the definitions there. I'm hurrying a little bit because we're short of time. Uh, so we've uh, both got the y sound and the word sound. Uh, in Spanish, they're best regarded perhaps as diphthongs, yesongs, and so now that's just another reminder to keep y and j separate, so we'll move over and on from that. And we'll have a look at uh, the work sound. Now, this is a voiced labial velar approximately. It's called labial velar because labial has something to do with the lips, and velar has something to do with the velum, the soft palate. And both of these um, are, are involved in the production of work. The thing to notice, though, is that the velar element in Spanish is rather stronger than it is in English. So in English words that begin with work, you have to be very careful not to say work and put in a g sound as well or to make it a binomial stop uh. So not would you like to go, or would you like to go, but would you like to go. So it's got to be work without a go there at all. And this, uh, some speakers find this rather difficult to do and are not aware that they're doing it at all. Um, the loan word, whiskey, well I think nowadays it's written more or less as it is in English or perhaps with an E in somewhere. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, if you look in uh, quite a lot of Spanish dictionaries and the official one, uh, you'll probably find that it's written as I've written it on, uh, on the slide, beginning with a G. Now, I thought it was time we had a little Jaimito joke. Um, could you read it out for me, please, so that everybody can hear what it sounds like, because not everybody in this room is Spanish. Jaimito le dice a su amigo, ya me sé los números en inglés. Y su amigo le responde, ¿y cómo es el uno? Y Jaimito le dice, one. Y su amigo le dice, caray, ¿cómo es mi primo? What was the name of the cousin? Juan. Juan, yeah. Now, jokes are sometimes uh, very useful things. I'm going to show you another joke now. This is half, one half of a telephone conversation. So here's somebody, uh, I got this off the television years ago. There's somebody here who says, Oh, you don't have to ask me to ask you. He answers, Me han dicho que hay uno en Gambia. And obviously, his, uh, the person he's talking to has never heard of Gambia. It is Gambia, see, sí. Gambia in Africa. Si, si, Gambia. Gambia. Con género, bueno. Not in English. Uh, jokes can be very useful. 
Right, well, assimilation. This occurs in both languages when a syllable ends in N and the next begins with W. But in English, a final N in this position usually becomes final M, whereas in Spanish it becomes final A. So if we have the sequence one week, one week, where we have one ending in N and week beginning in were. I can pronounce it, of course, very um, carefully and say one week. But I probably wouldn't. I'd probably say one week. One week. And the one, the N at the end, has become an M. One week. If you watch me, I'll do it very slowly, and you can see that my lips close for the M. One, one week. One week. So the final N has become an M. Or he's taller than William. Than William becomes than William. Than William. And this uh, third sentence is there so that you can go away and practice uh, later on. John was alone with when when Wendy arrived. You can practice doing lots of word sounds there, and uh, those that turn into uh, Now in Spanish, something different happens. If you have the sequence final N plus were, you get a different outcome, don't you? You get an N, sometimes a G, a G sound inserted before the word. So, un whisky, un whisky, un sandwich, like you could use sandwich. Now, in English, there is an assimilation in the middle of the word sandwich as well, but it's different. Whereas the Spaniard will say sandwich, Sandwich. I will say sandwich. Sandwich, and it turns into an air in English, you see. Finally, let's have a, a very quick look at the distribution of consonants in Spanish. The large consonant clusters of English don't occur in Spanish. In particular, words can't begin with S followed by a consonant in Spanish. So, whereas in Spanish we have, have España, Estación, Escuela, Esférico. In English, we have Spain, Station, School, and Spherical. Uh, so, a, a beginning with sir, not a little e sound put in before that. There are very few consonants permitted in final position in Spanish. There you have a list of them all, uh, all the ones I know about. These are the only sounds, only consonant sounds, that are permitted in final position. Now some of them I put a bracket down, the last four of them I put a bracket down, simply because these are really quite marginal. Um, the last one I find particularly interesting because my friends talk about going to a pub. And F doesn't occur in final position either in Spanish, and yet it seems to be in the loan word pub, it seems to have replaced the B at the end, and uh, certainly my friends talk about going for pa with an F at the end. Now we notice the effect of this, of the fact that uh, there are, is only a small number of final consonants permitted in Spanish, when Spanish speakers frequently substitute, substitute final N, final N, an alveolar nasal, instead of final M, a bilabial nasal in English. Uh, this is particularly noticeable on these three very common words some, sometime, or sometimes, and something. Now, it's not acceptable, I'm afraid, to say some sometime and something, you know, it mustn't be an N there, it must be an M. And someday and Sunday are not the same. They have to be different. One has an M in it, one has an N. There are three little um, three little sentences for you to practice at home. Tim came home by tram, lots of final M's there some ham sandwiches, and I come from Spain, which is just about the first thing anybody ever asks you is where do you come from? 
And immediately you have a problem because you've got to say, I come from Spain and it's got all these problems in it, haven't you? Well, it's very difficult to see how you can avoid that one. Uh, but all I can say is, keep practicing, stay cheerful, and stay optimistic. And thank you very much. Thank you.